this morning we're talking we're laying foundations uh, I didn't subtitle it this week but we're still in the same frame of mind in the beginning of the year with getting back to the basics and it's not like the basics are somewhat subpar to anything else that light is on. Is that light always been on? Yeah. Oh. On the camera, on the phone. It's like distraction. No, that's not what it is. Still, this is this fine. Okay. And so, one of the foundational principles that we need to know about getting back to the basics is the person of the Holy Spirit. I think this is one of the most important teachings. Not to say that anything is more or less important in the Word of God, but it's who is that ministry right now in the earth? The Holy Spirit. We know that there is a time when you had the father in the beginning in the Old Testament and then he sent his son. That was Jesus's ministry. And now Jesus is now left and now there's the Holy Spirit. And not to say that either either one of those were separate in action. They all operate as one. But we're getting into the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth this morning so that we can truly have an understanding we're going to end it, uh, in the baptisms, uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit and then get more in depth into it next week about baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do? And so I'm going to start out, or we're going to start out in John 14, verses 15 through 31, and I'm going to be reading, uh, and then I'm going to stop at verse 16, and I'm going to ask uh, Lady Branham to read just verse 16 in the Amplified, and then I'll continue reading uh, in, in the preceding verses. So, in verse 15, here is Jesus talking to his disciples. He's speaking to us. And in speaking to us, one of the very first things he says is something that is something uh, simplistic, but yet very important and very powerful. And he says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. So in other words, we talked about last week, we talked about faith and faith being in action, just like if you were sitting in a chair, I can say that I believe or I trust that the chair is able to carry my weight or do what it's designed to do, but it's not until I actually put that faith into action until my faith has become more real, so to speak. And so Jesus is saying, if ye love me, come. He's saying, if you love me, then keep my commandments. And in verse 16, in the Amplify, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, to be with you forever. Amen. Verse 16, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another so in other words, Jesus is saying this person that's coming in the place of in, in the place of me, not only is he not the, the Holy Spirit is not this ghostly figure that just hovers around and he's not this spirit force. He's actually a person. So just like Jesus was able to be here on earth, here is the Holy Spirit. But the difference between Jesus and the Holy Spirit in that Jesus in his earthly ministry was only able to be in one place at one time. He never ceased to be God. He was still 100% God and he was 100% man. But we see here the person of the Holy Spirit is everywhere. And he is a he. He is, I will give you another helper. And so in, in understanding what the Holy Spirit does, he's saying that he's a helper. So you say, Holy Spirit, I need help fill in the blank. I need help with not going off on this person. I need help with building my confidence. I need help with being able to resist temptation. I need help with whatever it is. He's our helper. So there is no excuse for us not saying that we have help. If there is a deficiency or if there is a lack in our lives, then there is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to step into the realm of his true office and ministry and to help you. That's what he's here for. 
comforter, advocate, intercessor. And we're going to go into all of these, but I'm going to hit on counselor. Counselor. The Holy Spirit is a counselor. And I see a lot of people, uh, especially particularly on social media, they'll, they'll post different things about what do you think about this? And, and what if this person had, you know, five kids, would you still marry them? Or what if this person did this? And this person did this? And, and what do you think about this? And if this person don't have a job, would you be that like this? And I'm thinking, why are we asking people their opinion when clearly the word of God says that the Holy Spirit is our counselor? Now, I'm not against Christian counseling. I'm not against natural counseling. I do believe that people need to go into the presence of other people that help them get through their issues. But ultimately, the Bible says that he is our counselor. So when he is our counselor, the Bible says that we are to seek him for counsel. I don't need to go on Instagram, Facebook, or anything like that to seek out the counsel of other people because ultimately, if I lean to their understanding, as the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all that God. It didn't say trust in your friend, your family, and anybody else. It say trust in the Lord with all thy heart. And lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And so in all of my ways, that's my day-to-day -day life. Nothing wrong with getting opinions from other people and everything like that, but it says, Jesus says that we are to be led by the Spirit. I can't be led by my emotions, how I feel, my opinion, the public court of public opinion. The Word of God needs to be the ultimate standard in my life. And if the Word of God is not the ultimate standard in your life, now you're going to be led astray. And see, what we need to be doing as leaders and people who we call ourselves men and women of God, we need instead of to start stirring up stuff, in a, in, a, in a realm of, of what if and who if and this, that, and other. We need to be pointing them to the word of God and saying, no, this is what God says about this matter. Holy Spirit is your counselor. And so now the best thing I can do for you if you're faced with a situation that is not necessarily revealed to me, we all know that if we're, we're talking to someone who's looking for a mate, that the Bible says don't be, do not be unequally yoked. But it doesn't stop there because just because you're a Christian, they're a Christian, doesn't mean that that's your wife and that's your husband. So now we need to be able to pray and ask God to give us revelation as to who it is that we are to be with. Jesus told his disciples, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah, some say you're one of the prophets, some say you're Jeremiah. Then he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter steps up and he says, thou art Christ, thou art the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, which means Peter, flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you. But my Father, which is in heaven. So the same way that Jesus said we need a revelation of who he is, how much more when we're choosing a mate, we need a revelation. Flesh and blood cannot reveal that. What does flesh and blood represent? His face, her face, the bicep, the triceps, the backside, anything else that you would use, the, the amount of money that that person makes, the degree that they have, the type of success that they have in life, because all success is not success in God. See, we got this thing, and I know I'm going off a little bit to, to the edge here, but I'm talking about a little bit about counseling today and understanding that the Holy Spirit is here to help counsel us. We got this thing in the world that we have defined prosperity in the church the way that the world does. Prosperity is not your bank account. Amen. Prosperity is not the amount of money that you have in your wallet. It's not the size of your house. It's not how many trips you take. It's not how many clothes you got. It's not any of those things. The word of God says that I pray that you prosper as your soul prospers. So if you can, if you're prospering in the area of finance, but your relationship is jacked up, then you're not prospering. If you are prospering in the realm of business and finance, but you all jacked up in the spirit realm and your relationship with God is jacked up, you are not prosperous. The Bible says, I pray that you prosper as your soul prospers. We're still talking about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the only one who can reveal to us our true condition and state. Sometimes we think of ourselves too highly, so to speak, and God needs to humble us and reveal to us, no, you don't have it all together. No, you don't have it going on. You have it going on until, going on according to the world standards, but according to my word, you don't have nothing going on. And so here we are in verse 16. Jesus is saying, I pray that the Father would send you this help. 
this person of the Holy Spirit. And the Greek word parakletos means one called along, one called alongside to help. Hence the idea of a comforter. One called alongside to help. I don't know about you, but if I got a task that I'm doing that may take me two hours and someone can come alongside and help me and cut that time down in half, how many people have turned that away? I know I will. I'm, if there's some help that I can receive, then I want that help. I don't want to be left to my own understanding when I'm trying to navigate through life and make decisions because I know, know, I know enough about me that in my own right mind that I'll mess something up. See, I, I've learned. God, God, God has got me to the place where I thank God that I'm humble enough to know that I can't figure it out. I don't want to figure it out. I want him to figure it out and guide me because he's already got to figure out. He's out there in Omega beginning and end. There's nothing that he hasn't seen that surprises him. In fact, he knows before you get there. And so it says in verse 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot see, or whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. The world doesn't see the spirit of truth. You know how the world doesn't see the spirit of truth? Because sometimes when you're trying to counsel with someone and they don't see it your way, that's because they're blinded. They've got believers who are blinded because they have not received the revelation that you have through the word of God. And sometimes we have, we have to do what Paul says, I planted Apollos, what of the God give the increase? Sometimes you just have to say your piece and leave it alone because everybody's not going to agree. Sometimes, and even Paul said it. Paul said, there's much you fighting, in being strifing. Are you not carnal? Some people are just carnal. We just have to keep it real. Some people just, but Paul said, I can't even speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto babes in Christ. So have you ever had to have a grown-up conversation with a baby? You can't do it. And God, God, go, go, God, God, God. Now, I need you to go over here, and we need you to go down the store, and God, 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 God. That, that sounds ridiculous. And Paul said, and yet we're doing the same thing in the spirit realm. We're having spiritual conversations with people who are still babes in Christ. The worst part about it is the people who are babes in Christ don't even recognize they still are. And so now here we're frustrated because we're trying to get a point across to where we think, George, surely you've been in the Word for 10 years. Surely you've been going to church. Surely you've been searching the Scripture. Surely you should understand and know this principle. And they don't because there's, there's a day and time today where people won't flub. People don't want the Word of God. People want to walk into a church and hear that they're going to be blessed. They're going to have a Maserati when they leave. They're going to have a big house. And God will bless them upon bless them upon bless them upon bless them. And then they don't want to hear about how to live their life and govern it according to the word of God. People don't want the Holy Spirit. What they do is, what they want is the Holy Spirit to support their agenda. You come alongside me as long as you agree with my foolishness. Don't come in here and disrupt my foolishness. I want you to come alongside and put your stamp of approval on it. And God is like, no, I'm sorry. I don't operate like that. And so, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. It don't even know him. That's why his voice sounds strange. The Bible says that my, 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 my sheep hear my voice, and a stranger they won't follow. What does that mean? My sheep hear my voice. He took his personal possession. He says, my sheep hear my voice. So if you're not one of his sheep, or if you're carnal, you allow the world to sear your conscience with a hot iron, there's certain things that you want to hear to anymore. And it says, because it seeth him not, neither know him, but ye know him. He's talking about us, the body of Christ. For he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. This was huge because prior to this, the Holy Spirit was in the temple of God. The Holy Spirit was relegated to the temple of God. The, the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. The people had to stay on the outside, and he had to go sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat so that he could atone it for the sins of the people. Now, when Jesus says, I'm ascending up onto heaven, and we're going to get into that, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to be in you. Now, we're that very temple of God where the Holy Spirit dwells. And so it says, I will not leave you comfortless, comfortless, verse 18. I will come to you. 
Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see him, because I live, ye shall live also. And that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, ye and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas said unto him, if not as scarlet, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. That's the litmus test. If a man love God, he will keep his words on a consistent basis, not perfection, but on a more, more often than not, we're going to recognize the fruit of an individual is doing that which is the, the, the word of God. And my father will love him and I will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. So he's saying, if that's my litmus test. If you don't love me, just don't do what I was telling you to do. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the fathers which sit me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. That's the same way the Holy Spirit does us. The words that we speak are not ours. And so, Jesus said so many times, blessed is he who is not offended in me. And what does that mean? He's saying, I'm not speaking in words of my own. I'm speaking that which I hear the Father. So when sometimes when we're, when we're when the Holy Spirit is speaking through us and we're talking to someone, it's just like you're driving down a road and the sign says 35 miles an hour is a speed limit. And you point to the sign and you tell them, listen, you're going 50, you speed. And then the first thing they want to do is jump on. Oh, you can't judge me. You don't understand. You drive. I don't know who you're talking to. And you're like, no, I, I'm not the messenger. I, I, I'm just one, one. I'm the messenger, so to speak. I am not the authority on the sign. The sign has always been there, but you upset with me because I shine the light on the sign. The word of the God, the word of God is the sign. And so when I point to you the word of God, the one who you're really upset with is God. But since I'm the physical presence of the individual who's giving you the message, now you want to call, call it focus, focus, shift the focus. You want to put the focus on me, don't put the focus on me. Put the focus where it needs to be on God. You want to get upset? I didn't make this word. This word was here before I, before I came. It's going to be here after I leave. And it's, it says it's in the word. The heavens and the earth shall pass away, but my word will stand. And so, your Jesus is saying, in verse 25, and the things I have spoken unto you, being at present with you. Verse 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. I teach underneath the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I don't teach my words. I stand up here, I study, I pray. Holy Spirit, what would you have me to say? Help me to not get in the way and Holy Spirit just take over. It's a supernatural thing when you just yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit and you allow him to teach you. And so he shall teach you all things. That's why the Bible says to study to show thyself approved. The Holy Spirit is not a respecter of person. He will give you revelation. He said, if you knock, you shall be answered. If you seek, ye shall find. And so, and he will bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave unto you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus is saying something so profound and so powerful here in the plot, especially in 2019. My peace I leave unto you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. Jesus was clearly saying that there is a peace that the world gives. The peace that the world gives is in the form of tangible things. Some people are only praising God, just like what the enemy tried to say that Job was doing. But Job proved the enemy wrong. But you have people who are, are, are on the opposite side of that spectrum. Some people are only praising God for image. And what I mean by that, I'm saying that 
people who people who are prospering, so to speak, in their way of prospering. They may have the houses, they may have the cars. They're only saying, bless the Lord. Hallelujah, highly favored. Glory be to God because they got two twenty fifty thousand dollars in the bank. But let a, a, a trial or a tribulation come and, and, and wipe all of that away. They'll curse God to his face. They'll stop praising him. That same smile you seen on their face on Wednesday will be gone by Friday if that happens. You'll be like, what happened to you? I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. Be like, wow, what's, whoa, what's going on? Man? What, hey, what happened? I lost all my money. All right. So, oh, so your joy and your peace was attached to things. Things have to be going right. There's been situations and circumstances that I've been in and I've asked the Lord, Lord, I need you to move this situation. I need you to turn this circumstance around. And I heard clearly, I am not going to change your circumstance right now. I'm just going to change the way that you react to it. Because when you can rise above a trial or a tribulation and still have peace, when people can be antagonizing you, when people can be talking about you, people can be roasting you, so to speak, and you still have peace, that's power. That's the Holy Spirit. That's something that's set aside for God. That's something that, that peculiar people that God was talking about now, you're peculiar because people are wondering how it is that you still got joy. You still got peace. You still pray for people. You still trying to help people, even though you're going through the worst of a storm. So Jesus said, my peace I leave unto you, not, not, not as the world gives, but the world gives a false peace. It's temporary. It's based in people, places, and things. And God wants to give us freedom in that. And sometimes God will shake up your world, so to speak, so that you'll recognize the only real peace, the only real joy, the only real stability is found in him. And so when you can get that, no matter what Paul said, no matter what, I learned it, whether, be, whether, I'm, whether I'm abound or whether I'm a base, whether with much or whether it be little, to be content. He could not rob Paul of his peace. He could not rob Job of it, Job of his peace. Job said, naked I came in this world, and naked I will leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That was an illustration of the peace that Jesus said, I leave unto you, because it's not shaken when things are shaken. He had heard now, and I said unto you, I'll go away, and if I come and, and come again unto you, if you love me, you will rejoice, because I say I go to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Here and after I talk not much with you, for the prince of the, this world cometh and have nothing in me. But the world that the but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do, arise, let us go hence. Jesus has given us a foundation. He's given us an ability to understand that the Holy Spirit is coming to do all of these things. And so in John 15, 26 and 27. But when the helper comes, who I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Amen. But when the comforter is come, and the comforter is here, whom I will send unto to you, unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth. We need truth in today's time. There are so many, and that's why we need to keep our, our, our situations and our circumstances out of the area of the court of opinion. When you invoke opinion, when you invoke uh, uh, someone else's thoughts on a particular situation, you're asking for someone else to give you an opinion on something that the Holy Spirit can give you leading and understanding on. The action word translated proceeded and the process continually proceeds. It means that it continually proceeds from besides 
and not out of the Father. It is so important to understand that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. There's no, there's, even though we say Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and we say the Holy Spirit is a third person in the Trinity, there's no first, second, and third. There's no inequality. They're all equal. And the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. And the Son is not the Father. This is all, there are they're three, but they're one. Just like a husband and wife are one. They're two people, but they're one, but they're on one accord. And so this is what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is not a lesser person. The Holy Spirit is just as much authority as Jesus was when he in the earth. And he is just as much authority as the Father is. They all have the same authority. And so the work of the Holy Spirit is what I want to talk about next. And it's so, it's so important that we understand the work of the Holy Spirit and that we get a grasp and an understanding of who he is and what he is in our lives. Uh, I want you to go ahead and read verses 7 through 16, and we'll pick up. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of, the tr of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak on this on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take for he will take of what is mine and declare it to, to you. All things that he all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I say that he will take of mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, you will not see me because I will go to the Father. Amen. Amen. Jesus always tells the truth because he is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But it says, for emphasis, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. He's letting the disciples know that it is at your best interest. It is, it, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. The Holy Spirit will not come unto you. He said it's so important that I leave. But if I depart, I will send him to you. I'm not going to leave you comforted. So I'm going to send you someone that is like me. I'm going to send you another me. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The work of the Holy Spirit is to reprove. There's a, there's a terminology. Did you? Okay. The work of the Holy Spirit is trans, the work of the Holy Spirit is to reprove. Translated in the Greek as elecho, meaning to point out a fault or error or expose something as it really is. The word reprove is also derived from another word meaning conviction, which embraces a number of biblical expressions in its meaning. It is also originally derived from two Latin terms meaning to cause to see. Which is why you offend people who may not see things the way that you do. And so, the work of the Holy Spirit is to reprove. What does that mean? To point out fault or error. It's like what I was talking about with the, with the sign. And sometimes people don't like when their faults are pointed out or their errors are pointed out. It is to expose something as it really is. It's as if a person is walking out throughout life and maybe they have four eyes and they think they only have two. 
And because it is that they, they think that they're normal, so to speak, and they think that their actions or their behavior is normal, when you point out that particular error, you expose something as it really is, it becomes an offense to them. Jesus said so many times, blessed is he who is not offended at me. See, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they had done stuff for so long, and they thought that they were right. They thought that they were righteous, to now here comes Jesus on the scene exposing them for who they really are, and they were offended. See, sometimes when you expose when you expose what people think is normal, as abnormal, now they got a problem. Because they're like, wait a second, I thought I was doing this the right way. Oh, I thought I was, and I thought I was in the right. And I thought I no, the word of the word reproof is the, the very meaning of conviction. And so we're talking about what the Holy Spirit does. It says it causes people to see. That's what we are to do. We are the lights of the world. We are the cause people to see. So many people are in darkness. And so when you come around, it's just like if you ever been in a dark room for a little while, maybe it's been a few hours, and what happens when that light comes on? Oh, man, it, it becomes offensive because the light is now meant to allow a person to give them power to see, but it's also offensive if it's not received in the right manner. So here we go with the three things that the Holy Spirit does. Sin. The Holy Spirit reveals the need of redemption. That's what the Holy Spirit's job is, is to reveal that a person is lost. A person has to first see themselves as a sinner. And so many people think that, you know, well, I'm a good person. I never murdered nobody. I never stole nothing. I never did this. I never. And God is saying that for all the sin that comes short of the glory of God, all sin is equal in God's eyes. I don't care uh, uh, whether a person uh, has murdered, robbed, stole, uh, told a, a, a lie, or whatever. God says all of that is equal. Every last one of those sins is equal. Man has made it so that there are categories, but man has made it so that there are categories so that they can feel better about themselves. Yeah, I cheated, but at least I ain't killed nobody. I did such a such, but at least I ain't never went to jail and I ain't never went to prison. The Bible says that all of sin have fallen short of the glory of God, and so all of your righteousness is as a filthy rag. God is saying that same sin that you are saying is nothing. It will send you to hell without the blood of Jesus Christ. So how little is it? You saying that is little so you can feel better about yourself, but God says that it is all filthy. And so we are never to look down our noses at anybody because the same blood is applied to our sins as applied to theirs. And Jesus said there's no respect of a person. There are no big eyes or little use in the kingdom of God. And so that's why it's so important for us to remember that when the Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 1, it says, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. He's talking to us. We want to get a self-righteous attitude that because we come from a particular background and because we ain't never did this or never did that, that somehow we're better than the next person. And that's a false pride. Matter of fact, the Bible says that that's devilish. To puff yourself up and to think that because you haven't done this and because you haven't done that, that you're somehow better than the next person. You're not. And the word of God says that you aren't. And so... Jesus is saying here, the word reprove, and he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe me not. Righteousness. The Holy Spirit receives the power. He reveals the possibility of becoming righteous. The Holy Spirit reveals the possibility of redemption, meaning that I'm revealing unto you that there's someone who has paid the penalty for your sin. His name is Jesus Christ. You receive him and your sins are forgiven. And you are now in, you're now, you're now uh, 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 in right standing with God. We talked about that, what righteousness means. It also talks about judgment. The Holy Spirit reveals the reality of redemption. The meaning, the reality of it is if you don't receive this Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what your faith is. And it's so in verse 11 of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I it, it mean, it's, it's already done. It, it, if you don't accept Jesus Christ on this side of heaven before your last breath is taken, there is a certainty of your future. There is no mistaken. Uh, there's no misstatement. There's no. There's no mistaking what's going to happen, so to speak. I have yet many things I say to you, but ye cannot bear them. How be it, the Spirit of Truth, when He has come, 
he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. I thank God for the Holy Spirit because the Bible says that he will show us things to come. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I've said things like, something told me that such and such was going to do such and such. Something told me it wasn't a something, it was a somebody, and a somebody was Holy Spirit. Sometimes what we do is we harden our hearts. The Bible says that today if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. What does it mean to harden not your heart? What it means to not harden your heart is it means that I don't close my ears to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit comes in the way and tells us to do something that we think is a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit difficult. Call this person and ask them to do that. I don't want to call that person. I don't want to bother them. About and you, and they, you keep telling them, call that person. All that prayer, you're like, oh, oh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And the whole time, the Holy Spirit is trying to help us. But a lot of times what happens is because we get into our own mindset of how we think that we should receive help and who we should receive it from, we block out certain people as a, a source of resource. No, that, that person, that, I can't do that, or I can't do that, or I can't do that. And the Holy Spirit is like, no, that's the very one that you need to call the very one that you're saying, don't make it like, oh, because you're leading to your own understanding. And so now, the Holy Spirit, he says, is the spirit of truth. And when he comes, he will guide you. There's that guidance. Everybody in our, in our and whoever went through uh, the public school system know what a guidance counselor is. They were supposed to help guide your education. They were supposed to help guide you in the right way. If you were supposed to be taking the English and taking honors and all, they were supposed to be helping you to guide your life so that you would end up with the most successful outcome. That's what the Holy Spirit is. He is our true guidance counselor. Someone who helps that, no, don't go, don't get a house in that neighborhood, go on over here. Well, why don't you try talking to this person and this, why don't you do this? And the whole time, the Holy Spirit. Now, the other part of that spectrum is sometimes when we're not necessarily hearing directly from him, he'll shut doors on us. And we're like, well, wait, what's up? You know, because every door that we walk through, we think that it's supposed to be the one that we're supposed to walk through. And the Holy Spirit is like, no, that's not the avenue, shut it. That's not the avenue, shut it down. No, that's not my time to shut it. And we're confused and we're hurt, but what we have to recognize is that if the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding us into all truth, we know that all things are working together for our good. And we know. But whatsoever things we shall, what are the things he hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. In other words, when the Holy Spirit is leading us, you can guarantee that the Father and the Son are on board with where he's leading us because they're never not on the same accord. They're all on one accord. And he shall glorify me, and, sh and for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. That's a litmus test for when you can tell whether somebody is operating in the spirit or all the spirit or operating in the flesh. If they're operating in the flesh and it's something that glorifies them, you know you need to back away from that. If they're doing something that seems a little ungodly and it's leading to temptation, whether leading to glorifying someone, glorifying God, I don't care if it's in the church because the Bible says that it's not about whether or not we're inside or outside of a church. He said at all times, the Holy Spirit is not relegated just to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. No, it's seven days a week. And so if we're doing something that we know is going to be a 